We recently installed our first system with the new refrigerant R32. Now, technically this wasn't our actual first system installation, but it's the first one that we filmed and the first one that we're talking about and making a video about. And the product that will be featured in this video is the Daikin Atmosphere. That was the product that we installed for this particular application. And you saw the thumbnail and read that right. This system is over 27 sear for the particular system that we installed. However, other systems in this same model sizing actually vary and will have lower efficiency than this model. And I'll talk about why in this video. And I'll talk about some of the other nuances and we'll even do a head-to-head -head comparison between the R410A version of the Atmosphere and the R32 version. And we'll look at some of the differences between the efficiency ratings and other performance ratings so that you can make an informed decision and we can see whether or not R32 is all it's cracked up to be. And I'll give you my final thoughts on that as a refrigerant. But before we get started, if you haven't done so already, please make sure you smash that like button for the algorithm and consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't done so already. We put out daily and weekly content on how you can get the best HVAC for your home. So if you're in the market for HVAC system replacement and you're interested in content like this, liking the video and subscribing to the channel is a free way that you can show support if you found this content helpful. So the first thing I wanna talk about in this particular scenario, and I actually have the submittal sheets which have the data in terms of the efficiency ratings for the particular models within the Atmosphere lineup pulled up on my screen. I have the R32 system that we installed as well as the 410A system in a different tonnage. And so I just want to dive into this and show you some of the differences because as you can see here, this system that we're looking at right now, this is the 9000 BTU version of the Daikin Atmosphere in the R32 version. And as I mentioned, the SEER rating on this is 27.4 SEER. However, one thing I want to point out is when we jump over to the two ton version, you can instantly see that the two ton version, the SEER rating with the same refrigerant, so no differences. This is the R32 version, but just in the two-ton sizing, drops all the way down to 22. Now, it's not that big of a difference, and those are literal numbers that can be SEER and EER, for example. That is just a formula. So if you take 27.4 and divide it by 22, or rather take 22, and you take that difference as a ratio, in this instance, 9,000 BTU version versus the two-ton version is basically 20% more efficient. So it's not a huge difference in efficiency between the different sizing in these models, but it's just something to point out because oftentimes we've seen people get new systems installed and the system that will be marketed as a 16 SEER system when in actuality their particular matchup might only be 14 SEER or even lower in some cases. Normally it's not going to be requirements for SEER 2. It has to be above 14 SEER anyways. But the bottom line is in this particular instance, I just wanted to point out that the efficiency does vary quite a bit within the same model. Now, if we look at the 12,000 BTU version or the one ton version, version, as you can see, the SEER rating differs just between these two units from R32 to R410A, and it's a relatively decent change. So if you look at the R410A version, this system has a SEER rating of 20 SEER, EER of 12.5, HSPF rating of 12, and COP, which stands for coefficient of performance of 3.9. And what that means, COP is the most simple formula in practical terms, because what it means is for 3.9 watts of heat to be produced, Produced, or 3.9 kilowatts of heat to be produced, it takes one watt or one kilowatt of electricity. So it's really just a ratio that expresses that uh, how much electricity this uses to produce the same amount of heat. Anything above three is very efficient. And that COP is going to fluctuate based on the outside temperature. That's what some of this nomenclature here is. I'll explain that shortly. But if we look at the R32 version in the same size, as you can see, this is the one ton version. And this is also the one ton version. You can see the sear jumps up all the way to 25.2. Now, that's about a 20% increase in efficiency versus the non-R32 system. Now, this is going to vary widely across manufacturers and models. So don't think that R32 is just across the board 20% more efficient because that is absolutely not the case. But the bottom line is I'm more using this as an example to show you that you're going to get pretty modest or moderate efficiency gains with R32, but it's still impressive to see the differences. And as you can see here too, on the COP side, this particular system has a COP of 4.4. So the amount of heat that it is able to output is about just doing math in my head around maybe 10 to 20%, a little over 10% increase in terms of the COP as well for the same amount of electricity produced. And that's why the HSPF rating is actually 13 versus 12. So it's a very modest increase, less than 10%, but still an increase nonetheless. So looking at these two systems, you can see this is the actual model that we installed. This is the 9000 BTU system. 
this is the one that's 27 sear. If you're looking at these numbers and thinking, I wanna get the highest sear rated system, one thing that I wanna point out before you make that assumption is if you are primarily using your heat pump or heating, sear actually doesn't matter that much because sear is a reflection of air conditioning efficiency. It's not related to heating efficiency. If you're looking for heating efficiency ratings or ratings related to that, the most important one is HSPF, which is now HSPF2 for all the SEER2 units that have come out and the SEER2 updates that happened last year. But the bottom line is HSPF is a reflection of how efficient the system is in heating mode as well as COP. So as you can see, even this unit, the COP within the model actually varies from unit to unit. So it's 3.5 on the two ton version. And this is also an R32 system, but in the 9,000 BTU unit, the efficiency in heating mode is almost 20% or a little over 20% more. And the reason for that is just, that's always how the systems work. I don't actually know why the smaller systems are more efficient. I just know that I've noticed this as a pattern when I'm sizing systems or looking at submittal sheets and looking at the data on these particular models. They're always going to have the most efficient system is actually going to be the smallest system. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, well, should I just install two smaller systems? The short answer is no, not unless your house is set up to best be, you know, ran that way. So if you have ductwork for two systems already, then absolutely that's going to be most efficient because you're able to pinpoint where you're heating and or cooling, and you're just going to get a more comfortable house, but it's definitely not going to be more efficient or cost effective because you have the cost of two systems. So it's two systems to replace. So obviously the efficiency is not that much greater, but it is a little bit greater. So if you're on the fence with sizing or you don't need something or that is quite so big and you're maybe wanting to go a size down, you can definitely do that and get a little bit more efficient system. This particular system was installed on a detached garage. And so it wasn't that critical. But when we do that video and show you, and that's going to happen at the end of this video, when we show you how that system keeps up, you'll be pretty impressed with the results. I know that I was, we'll show you that in action, looking at some of this heating performance. So at 47 degrees Fahrenheit, this thing is putting out 11,000 BTUs. Its maximum output is 19,000 BTUs. So that's almost one and a half tons of heating capacity at 47 degrees. And then at five degrees, it's still able to put out a max capacity of 11,000 BTUs in heating. So it doesn't derate at all from its 47 degree rated output. So it's a very efficient system. And the COP at five degrees external outdoor temperature is producing a COP of two. That's what that 2.0 next to it means. So your efficiency does drop as it gets colder outside because the system does have to work harder to extract heat from that cold air. That's what's happening with your condenser when it's five degrees or zero degrees outside. So it's very efficient. The operating range in heating mode is negative 13 to 64 Fahrenheit. And honestly, I think the system will work below 13. It doesn't have like an absolute shutoff. It's just the efficiency goes down and it becomes less efficient to run at those lower temperatures, but it will still continue to provide heat. So before we go outside and we show you this unit in action and show you some of the decibel readings that we got on this particular unit, which I was actually pretty impressed with. And we show you some of the installation best practices that we like to follow when we're installing these systems. What I want to talk about is this particular system does qualify for the heat pump tax credit. So if you're interested in the 25C, which is that $2,000 heat pump tax credit, that's a federal heat pump tax credit that you can take advantage of. This system does qualify. And if you're in the state of Colorado, it also qualifies for the state of Colorado heat pump tax credit as well. So that's an additional $1,500 or up to $1,500 that you can get as a rebate it has to be issued through a participating contractor. And there's a lot of different rebates like this, but this is a very efficient system as the bottom line. So whether you're in a heating market or a cooling market, as you can see, that high sear rating is much more relevant for air conditioning because that is a reflection of how well the system cools from an efficiency perspective in terms of electrical efficiency and how much energy it consumes. And from a heating perspective, it's very efficient as well. But the bottom line is this is a great system. So if you're looking mini split for a part of your house or for ADU or for a detached garage, this is an excellent system. It's very efficient. And it also qualifies for some of those tax credits. Now, before we go outside, there's one more thing I want to talk about, which is some of the differences between 410A and R32. And just to clear up some misconceptions, because some people have been resistant to the new refrigerant R32 coming in. R454B is another option that will be out there, but all Daikin products and Goodman and Amana are going to be using R32. And if you're concerned about this, because there's some information out there that will tell you that it is technically mildly flammable, the truth about it is that it is not very flammable at all, meaning that you have to hold a steady ignition source to it, like a flame, in order for it 
to ignite. And a fun fact is that R410A is actually a blended refrigerant and it's already composed of 50% R32. If you have a residential HVAC system that was installed anytime in the past 20 years, you're already using 50% R32 in the blend of the refrigerant. As far as why they're phasing it out and why they're phasing R32 in, that's a long conversation that we discuss in another video, which I'll make sure to link at the end of this if you haven't checked that out already. As you can see, there are some slight efficiency gains going with an R32 unit versus an R410A unit. So if you're on the fence about which refrigerant to use while you still have a choice before they stop making 410A equipment, I can tell you that when we installed the system, there was not a lot of differences from an installation perspective compared with a 410A system. And if you hadn't had told me that we were installing an R32 system, I honestly would not have known the difference or noticed anything different between the 410A systems because all of the safety features that incorporate with the refrigerant in terms of they have leak detection built in to the motherboards on these systems. There was no added installation steps on this particular unit. It's all completely integrated. One thing I will say that I really did like about this unit that I thought was nice was it actually has a Wi-Fi module built in so you can connect it to the Daikin Comfort app and have Wi-Fi control over your AC. I will say the app was very finicky, but I was eventually able to get it connected and get it up and running on Wi-Fi. So it is working, it does work, but it was a little finicky to get started. And the thing I immediately noticed in the reviews of the app was how finicky the app was and how many people had various issues with it during the commissioning process. So in summary with this unit, it's a great system, performs very well in cold temperatures. So if you're looking for something that can keep up in a cold climate, this is definitely a cold climate heat pump and is categorized as such. It qualifies in the North for that heat pump tax credit. And I believe it qualifies in the South as well because the efficiency ratings are high enough from both a SEER and an EER perspective that it hits the needed requirements in order to qualify for that tax credit. And right now we're gonna go on site to show you this installation, to show you some of the best practices that we like to follow when we're installing a new system in a new mini split. And I'll show you how the system sounds when it's running. We'll do a decibel test so you can see how loud or how quiet the system actually is. But before we do that, if you haven't done so already, please smash that like button for the algorithm and consider subscribing to the channel if you found this content helpful so far. So we're outside right now. We are at the outdoor unit. This is the R32 system that we installed. This is a 9,000 BTU Daikin Atmosfera. It's running super quiet right now and I'm actually gonna throw the decibel reading up on the screen. And as you can see, this thing was running around 40 to 42 decibels. Most of the sound was actually coming from me just barely slightly moving the phone. But once I held my phone steady, it was registering around 40 decibels. So this thing is super quiet and that was keeping the phone right here, like right next to the condenser. So we knew we were getting a good reading on what the actual sound or the decibel rating is. And some of the installation best practices we like to touch on. So this white stuff you can see, that's what the line set is ran inside. And we use line hide. It's basically an aesthetic. It makes for a nice, clean, tight, tidy install. So all of our components are ran inside there, including the condensate drain in this particular application, as well as the electrical for the head unit, which connects uh, to the condenser, as well as the line set. One of the most important things that you can do in any climate that you're installing these is that penetration. If you look that where it penetrates the wall inside, the most important thing you can do is spray foam that because inside the wall on the indoor unit, which we'll throw up some footage of the indoor unit here so you can see what the indoor unit looks like. But that head unit has a thermistor, which takes the temperature of the inside room. And if that is not insulated well, what will happen is it'll actually take the temperature reading of the outdoor temperature and it'll think it's either super cold or super hot in there. And so it won't heat or it won't cool or it can overheat or overcool if it's not getting the actual temperature of the room and instead is getting feedback from the outdoor air temperature. So something important to do and the rest of the stuff that we do is just code and, and best practices. So we do have a surge protector installed and then this is a, a disconnect with a built-in GFI, which you're supposed to have a GFI installed on a dedicated circuit. So that's separate from the circuit that this is installed on. And then if you look at the indoor unit, we can throw up the footage right now where you can see that indoor unit. Uh, the biggest thing is just having a slight slope to the right or wherever the drain is on this particular unit. The drain is on the right. And if you have that slight slope, that basically makes sure that you don't have water building up in the drain pan of the unit and it's draining out properly. And that's also why it's important to make sure that the condensate drain actually runs along the bottom of the line hide. So that way it has nice slope coming out and it, there's not kinks. Uh, that's also why I like to cut all the zip ties before 
we put the cover on because the zip tie, sometimes you'll see that, that will create kinks. And it's not so much a kink in the condensate line because the, the condensate tubing that you use for this particular application is no kink. So it doesn't actually kink. But what can happen is it will create little divots and valleys. And so as a result, condensation will build up in those little divots and valleys. So we hope you found this content helpful. If you did, please smash that like button and consider subscribing for the algorithm. And as mentioned in other videos, uh, we do have a referral program. If you are looking for a contractor in your area that's familiar with some of the higher end, higher efficiency technology that we talk about on this channel, that's why we created the HVACDopeShow.com where you can go and you can request information and request a referral from a contractor in your area. And we actually hand pick and hand select some of these contractors. And a lot of them will be featured on the show if they haven't already. So if you've been watching the show and have started to see some of the interviews pop up, it's for some of those hand picked contractors that we've worked with. And it's really just a way to connect, you know, the best contractors with homeowners and homeowners with what they're looking for so that they have a good experience because I know how hard it is to find a contractor that knows what they're doing and knows how to install some of the higher end technology. So we hope you found this content helpful. And if you did, again, please smash that like button for the algorithm and consider subscribing to the channel and check out these next videos that are popping up on the screen that YouTube thinks you should watch. And we'll catch you on the next episode.